Hey, everybody. Welcome today. I uh, appreciate you all being here. I, I'm kind of excited about this. Rick Fuller and I have been working on um, different ways to um, enhance our organized sales process so that we can be in, you know, two things really to to improve uh, our conversion rates and, and, and do a better job representing our clients um, so that we can make more income. That's number one. And number two, so that we can be in compliance with uh, both the National Association of Realtors and the United States Department of Justice. So we, you know, stay on the right side of the of of, uh, of the law <laughs> with regards to how we are practicing real estate. And, you know, I think that that uh, there's a lot of work has gone into to what we are doing today. And I mean, it's all, you know, hopefully you can all send me flowers because I am you know, constantly spending, spinning my wheels, trying to, uh, and Rick for that matter, trying to improve a lot of our training systems to get up to date. So we had to go back to work as well too. But I think what you're going to see today is the result of a lot of that. And hopefully you can take these as actionable items so that after this, uh, after watching this, you can turn around and be ready to go full steam ahead uh, to both of those ends. So with that being said, um, I would like to have Rick Fuller kick it off. Thanks, Brian. So we've been talking about the uh, NAR settlement and the processes that we need to put in place. And I've been using a baseball metaphor. And so I think this helps articulate the story. And then we'll kind of we'll follow this theme throughout our call today. And I've been asking people who are the greatest baseball player in history is. Uh, Brian, who do you think is who? Are the, and if, by the way, if you think, you know, put, drop it in the chat box. But who do you think people are coming up with the greatest baseball player in history? I would say if you pulled most people, that would be like a Babe Ruth. You know, Babe Ruth got a freaking candy yeah. bar. You know, that that's a big one. Yeah. I'm from California, so a lot of those guys are going to say Barry Bonds. You know, um, he, he, yeah. he maybe enhanced his performance a little bit. So maybe a Barry Bonds or also California. I'm a USC guy, so I could say Mark McGuire. You know, all the, all the guys that, that, that hit for glory, you know, Did, those guys. Didn't you name your dog after a baseball team? Or am I mistaken there? I have a little border collie named Dodger. That's correct. I was going to name my other dog Mookie, but it's a girl, and my wife fought me on that one. But yeah, the uh, all right. So uh, that's the same. Res uh, you know, that's the same response. I'm asking people, hey, greatest baseball player in history. They're saying Babe Ruth. They're saying Barry Bonds. They're saying Hank Aaron. They're saying Ty Cobb, and uh, and those are incredible players. There's no doubt. But when you look at their stats, Brian. Uh, Babe Ruth, for example, was averaging 7.6%. That means that every one in 12 times that he got up to bat, he hit a home run. One in 12. Hank Aaron, 7.5%. One in 13. Babe Ruth, 7.1%. That's one in 14. For every time that guy gets up, it takes 14 times before he hits a home run. And you know, in all of the times I've asked that question, you know who nobody mentions? a guy by the name of Ted Williams. And Ted Williams, he's also from California. He's from one of your right. favorite communities, San Diego. Walk through the SFO airport, you got a big statue of him. Nobody ever mentions his name. And that guy, every time he got on base, 50%, every time he got to bat, 50% of the time he got on base. So the others are categorized by home runs. He is the like base hitter king. And nobody's talking about Ted Williams and how incredible of a baseball player he is. And what we would tell you in real estate, you got to stop being a home run hitter and you've got to be a base hitter. Base hitters will be more productive. Base hitters are going to happen more often. And unlike uh, baseball, you can stack the bases. You can have lots of contacts. You can have lots of customers, lots of clients, lots of contracts, and you can run through the bases. So I'm going to share my screen right now, Brian, because that's what we want to cover today is having an organized sales process because the NAR agreement says that you and I have to have a written agreement with a buyer. That's what it says. And if that proposal goes through, then we need to make sure that we're prepared for it. So Brian, let me kind of walk through what we're thinking. The difference between running a sales job and a business could be defined in one word. It's you and I having a process. And there is no more of an important process than having an organized sales process. So today we're breaking this down into a baseball metaphor so that you can remember it, so it's familiar, you can teach it and coach it to the people that you're leading and guiding in your real estate business. So let me walk through just a few of these, Brian, then we'll kind of get into a discussion. I know we want to take like first and second base and go deep 
because that's the NAR settlement. But here's the thing that we need to understand is that we've got to make sure we're hitting base hits and not trying to hit home runs. The days of hitting home runs are over. Uh, the days of saying, oh yeah, the seller will pay my real estate commission, don't worry about it. Those things are over. We now need to make sure that we're base hitters. And that base goes from contact to customer. Contact, you might describe as a lead. You might describe it as a prospect. You might have a name, you might have a phone number. You might have a name, you might have an email. You might have some info, it could came from Facebook, it could be a referral. It, it's a contact. You got a contact in your cell phone. Hey, I saw this new sign. I, make, I saw this new sign up for sale in my neighborhood. I want to go see it. I think I might want to buy this house. That's a, that's a lead. Contact. It's a lead. It's a prospect. It's a contact. That's what you got, Brian. That's right. You, you probably don't have everything to make it a customer. You, you only got a contact. You don't know if they've got an agent. You, Brian, you don't know if they're really serious about buying. You don't know if they pre-qualify. You don't know any of that stuff. You got a right. contact. And in real estate, Brian, it's a contact sport. Like we have to absolutely have a ton of contacts. We're in the business of making contacts. A lot people. of people swing for a home run right there. They swing for a home yeah. run right there. They yeah, don't go for a single or a double. They don't. They they, they they don't try to make them a customer. They don't try to make them a client. They try to get that freaking or, or they, you know they try to get a contract at the triple. They just want to go show. Yeah, they popped into the open house. Uh, the average buyer is in the market for 18 to 24 months today. They walk into an open house and then we're trying to swing, you know, for the fences uh, and get them into contract before they leave. And they're not ready for it. When we rush that process, we lose a ton of people because right. nurturing is your gold mine of your business. Batting average goes down. All right. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we want to get on base and we want them to become a customer. And, until, and if you have contacts, it is very difficult to quantify your business uh, because you don't know where they're at in the funnel. They could be at the, they could be a Facebook lead, they're probably at the top of the funnel. They could be a, a lead that comes in from you know Google AdWords, top of the funnel. They could be a past client that their entire family has used you for generation and they're at the bottom of the funnel. These are likely to convert. And until you have a customer, we would tell you it's very difficult to quantify your business because it's very difficult to say, I have so many customers, therefore this is my pipeline. This is how many people are gonna close escrow. But you can begin to quantify your business when you have customers, when you have customers. And Brian, there's a lot of definitions to customers, but I'm gonna give you what I think our five are. You add whatever you think uh, that there are, that you know I'm missing. But I think you gotta have a legitimate name to make them a customer. I think you got to have a real phone number. I think you got to have a legitimate email address. Like these are three things that they must have in order to be a customer. They're, we're advancing them from a contact. Uh, they got to want to buy now or sometime in the future or sell. Like that, they got to be a customer. And then they've got to not have a written agreement already with another agent. That's a problem. And so I think they got to have name, phone number, email address, want to buy now or in the near future, have not or are not an agent makes them a customer. Now we're on first base. Am I leaving anything out in that conversation? Uh, and we're still on the phone, correct? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it could be a, yep. Okay, good deal. No, no, I'm we're, fine. We're a customer. To, to, to be a customer, I think I'm right there. And, and all we've done is yeah. we've made contact at this point, correct? So all we've done is made contact. Yeah, we've you, spoken to them. We do not have any type of sit down appointment set yet, correct? Not yet. We just know that they have a name, they have a phone number, they have an email address, they want to buy now or sell now or in the future, and they are not or have not an agent. I think we have a like customer. that makes them a this is on the line. And now they're now they're quantifiable. By the way, we've discovered that for every 10 customers you have, one will close. That's our conversion. Yours might be better, yours might be worse, but now it's quantifiable. Hard to quantify at contact, really hard to contact. You know, if, I, if I'm shopping for a TV, uh, I, I go to various stores. I go to the Best Buy, I go to the Costco, maybe Walmart, whatever. I'm looking for a flat screen TV. By the way, they're cheap today. I'm a customer. But if I have an attorney-client relationship, I, I'm a, just that. I'm a client. I'm a client at my doctor's office. I'm not a customer at my doctor. They're going to have you sign a ton of paperwork in that waiting room before you become a client and we're defining client here, Brian, as somebody who has a written representation agreement with you, which is exactly 
what NAR is specifying in their proposal that real estate agents are going to be required to have before, catch this, before they go out and show property. And that's a client. They have a written agreement with somebody uh, to represent them. So we have to transform them from a customer on yeah. first base to a client on second base. And so yep. the idea of a lead calling us and saying, I want to go show a property and you hopping on your horse and opening up that door and showing a property without a written agreement. I can see how people that are used to that. I mean, quite frankly, a lot of the online portals taught their 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 agents to do it that way. Um, they taught them that. Yep. Like you know, Zillow would say, "No, no, no, we don't do buyer consultation appoints appointments. That's too hard. We want you just to show the house." Um, so now you go show the house, and we wonder. And, and a lot of those agents that are used to that, which is understandable, you're used to that. You're saying, "How am I going to get a buyer agency agreement signed? Like you know, how am I going to get paid?" Well, that is tough when you're swinging for the home run. You're going for that contract on yep. third base. Um, you know, all, you know, you're going for that big hit when we need to slow down and go for singles and doubles, customers and clients, what we're really trying to break the entire sales process down into chunks and you're moving one base at a time. Yep. So we need to move towards that appointment. Now, maybe that appointment's in a Starbucks right next to the house. Maybe it's in your office. Maybe it's in a quick zoom meeting beforehand. Maybe yep. it's on the, could even be on the hood of a car, but we're going to need to move to that appointment yep. before we hurry up and try to show a home. That's going to be the shift. And Brian, uh, I'll, I'll show you this uh, image here. If I can pull this up and they go back. Uh, this is from the California Association, uh, pardon me, the National Association of Realtors, uh, NAR. They put out a home buyer seller survey every year. And here's what they've discovered about eight working with age, agents, working with buyers and having a representation agreement. And I'm not going to get into the age groups. There's a lot of similarities, some differences. But here's what they said is that of all buyers, 14% of them did not know if they had an agreement or not. That's a problem. They don't even know if they're a client or a customer. 34% uh, of all buyers in 2023, according to the survey, said, no, we had no written agreement with our agent. Um, and then 18% uh, rather said, yeah, we had an, an agreement, but it was oral. Like, you're my agent. I'm your client. Okay. All right. And only 35%. And so one of the reasons why we made a really quick audible and I asked Brian Eisenhower to join me on this call is we realized 65% of real estate agents do not have an organized sales process that culminates in signing a written agreement before they go out and show property. And this is, this is in my opinion, this is why we've seen such a deterioration to the brand of a real estate professional. Because we've been in a hurry to try to sell them a property, we've come across more of a salesperson than we have as a consultant to help them secure the next biggest transaction of their life. And so 35% of people are, are getting a written agreement, 35% of agents with a buyer. That's a huge problem for our industry coming up. Agreed. So the key here is we're, we're trying to move from first base to second base, right? We're trying to go from customer to client. And, and what that means is we're trying to go from contact to appointment set, right? We got to set an appointment. Yeah. And so when we get that lead, we're trying to set an appointment. That is the, that is the mission. It's not to try to, to get them into the house. We're, we're trying to set that appointment, right? So it could be, you know, scripts yeah. as simple as, hey, I am now required to meet with you beforehand. So if we could just meet really quickly at the Starbucks before we walk in there, I'm required to disclose yeah. to you our agency relationship. You are now. You know, it could be the broker requiring you. It could be the Association of Realtors requiring you. I don't. I wouldn't really get into all that. They don't understand all that. But we do need to set them straight on the agency relationship. That we absolutely do. That is required. Yep. And it could be on the hood of your car out in front. But say, hey, let's get there a couple minutes early because I just have to show you some paperwork beforehand, and I have to explain my roles to you beforehand. Whatever you like. 
And then they're going to say, that's fine. No problem. And depending on how you can schedule it or how you can get in there, you know, there's lots of different ways to set an appointment. And then once yep. they say, okay, go ahead, Rick. Did you say something? Agreed. Yep. And agreed. then so quickly what I'd say, and, I, and they'd say, yes, I'd say, thank you. Hey, I just need to ask you a few more quick questions before we meet. This will help me um, get you set up and, and so that we can move faster once we get there. How does that sound? And they're going to say, that's great. So you're going to ask them a few more quick questions. And at that point, this is where everyone, I'm going to share my screen here, will use a buyer lead sheet or a buyer questionnaire. Okay. And really quickly, I would try to get through as many of these questions as you can on the phone before you meet them in person. Okay. Now you may not get through all of them, but this is not that hard. You should have the top part pretty much filled out. But we got to do some sort of diagnosis so we have a clue of what their best interests are, okay? this If you don't have time for this or you don't have this sheet in front of you, shame on you. But you can always use LP Mama, LP Mama right? Which is location, price. Are you working with another agent? Do you have a mortgage? What is their motivation? And then we set the appointment. And that's LP Mama. It's the oldest thing. It's been around for about 70 years in real estate. It's how you convert a sign call. LP Mama is a little bit more detailed on a buyer lead sheet. We can get more specific. And it, 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 without using a buyer lead sheet, without asking all of these questions from a prospective lead on the phone, that consultation appointment is going to go a lot longer. Not to mention, if they've already told you all of these needs and information about themselves, they feel vested with you. They feel tied to you. They also feel like you care about their needs, like a professional would. Can you imagine going to a doctor and having him not take your vitals or anything and check you out to see if you're okay first? He just threw you a bunch of meds across the counter? That wouldn't feel very professional. You wouldn't even think that doctors do that much. You wouldn't feel like doctors deserve those high prices. That's what happens. That's the net net result of agents that just hurry up and people please and open a door for a client and confirm to that client that's really just a customer that they don't really know anything or add any value at all. You just told them all you are is a door opener. So they don't believe that you deserve much more information. But you're going to ask them a lot of questions here because you're not a people pleaser, just like doctors don't just write you scripts on the street corner. They actually put you through their organized process. So we need to know this information up front so we can sit down and not to mention, we'll know a lot of their objections up front. We'll actually weed out people that are working with other agents. We'll weed out people that don't want to work with you. We'll know what they're qualified for. They may not even know if they're qualified for a home and you're going in there. They've got the cart way before the horse. We can maybe get them by the time we schedule the appointment, we could get them to at least speak to a lender on the phone that way beforehand there's a lot of ways you can add value and show them that your process is better than their process might make them think about things they didn't think about before and that's how you demonstrate professionalism you demonstrate knowledge and value that way you don't let drunk people drive the bus drunk people driving the bus that's a client who thinks they know everything about real estate by the time we get that showing it could be four days from now and that house is already sold and they're not even ready to go because they don't even met with a lender yet. They need to hurry up and get an offer in there. Now it's the weekend. We have to wait till Monday, you know, things like that because you let the drunk guy drive the bus. You need to tell them why it's important we get to that lender now. This is going to be competitive. I already talked to the seller's agent. They're taking offers on this. There's like eight showings this week. So yes, we're going to have to change and quite frankly, do it the way that we've been trying to teach you to do it all along. This is nothing new, but there's so many agents who have been opposed to locking clients into an agency agreement. Well, now the law is saying you have to do it. So now I am right. Now I am right. Your people pleasing has been deemed price fixing. That makes sense. So let's set the appointment. Then let's ask a few more questions. That's how we're being the doctor, you know, putting the tongue depressor down on the thumb and the lights in the ears and up the nose and having to weigh in you and all that kind of stuff, taking your temperature. That's what we're doing with a buyer lead sheet. We're finding out their needs and their situation so we can actually act in their best interests, not just opening doors and writing offers. I mean, you can sell a bag of oranges on the street corner. I mean, that's what that is.
And yes, people will think you don't deserve a lot of commission for that. But we need to find out about our clients' needs first. So we set the appointment yep. that way, then we back up and ask a lot of questions. So then we can prepare for that appointment based upon their answers to that, that those questions. And we can start demonstrating value ahead of time. Because you know as well as I do, you show them a house and they're not ready to buy that house to waste everybody's time, their time. And that's how you, I mean, especially in competitive low inventory markets, when there's 10 offers on a property, they're not ready to go strong yet. That makes sense, Rick? Yeah, it I'll sure does, Brian. So I'll maybe it we'll take to it to what the appointment action. Yeah, what do we, maybe we look at what the actual appointment looks like. Uh, because we now know that 65% of agents probably don't have that kind of appointment. They certainly don't conclude in a written agreement, whatever you call it in your state, every state calls it something a little bit different. And so we're gonna we're gonna advocate that you kind of have a four step process when you go through that appointment. They either showed up at the office, they even via Zoom, you, you did it on the hood of the car as Brian was saying earlier. Whatever the case is, you need to have a, a four-step process. So we would advocate the first step of that is just lead in. It's just getting to know the, the person you're talking to. And if you're an extrovert on the call, like you need no explanation on what an, an, a lead in is. It's just getting connected, it's just building that relationship, it's building rapport. But there are introverts on the call that they're eating this up right now because they need a, a, a method, they need a way, a track or something to follow that helps them make a connection with somebody new. Somebody that came in via Zillow or open house or whatever, and they don't have a relationship. And how do you make that connection quick? We, quick, we call it lead in. And if you're a, um, you know, you gave LP mama, Brian, and, and that goes way back. Here's another one that goes way back is Ford. If you need some help, use family, occupation, recreation, dreams. Like you can use this to break the ice, to make connections. And if you can find things that are in common, you will make connections very, very quickly. And that's that lead in process to this appointment. If you're with an, it, with an introvert, you better make it short. If you're with an extrovert or a high I disc personality profile, like you might wanna expand on this a little bit. If you're with me, like you better be getting right to the point really quick and come with the dollar per ounce, the dollar per square foot, whatever it is. If you're with my wife, you better take some time to build that report and ask about the kids and what's going on and this and that. It, it's You're going to have to mirror and match based on the people that you're working with. Now we have a course all about this, Brian, called the DISC course. Like you can go in and watch this DISC course so that you can learn the D-I-S-C behavior um, in, CT, in, the, in the custom training suite so that people can learn how to match those behaviors so we can build that proper relationship. Even in 2024, people still biz do business, catch this by people they know, like, and trust. In 2024, the fourth industrial revolution, the day of AI and big data and artificial intelligence and Amazon and all the rest, and people are still doing business because they know, like, and trust you. Don't underestimate the lead in which is step one. All right, can we go to step two, Brian, or do you have more yes, to add on that? We can. Let's We're go good. to step two. Let's, we gotta move, keep moving things along. We want you to investigate. We want you to ask three, we want you to ask three categories of questions. Now, Brian gave you that lead sheet, got some of that stuff, but I want you to investigate uh, them financially. Are they ready? Do they need to get pre-approved, pre pre-qualified? Uh, do they need to save up money? Do they understand what a down payment is? Do they have the deposit? All the stuff that you, this is the executive leadership mastermind. I, don't have, I shouldn't have to break down all the stuff financially it takes for a buyer to buy a property today, but you got to investigate that. The last thing you want to do is to show them a home above or below their means. Show them a home above their means and everything's going to be compared to that home. Show them a home below their means, they're going to be frustrated and quit and they're never, you're never going to get a second showing. Like find out what they qualify for. That's what that first step is. Here's number two, timing matters. Everybody talks about real estate as location, location, location. You know what it, what it also is? Location, 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 and timing, timing, timing. Here's what I mean by that. You bought a home uh, prior to COVID. It's now worth nearly twice the amount in some markets today. You bought a home in the 50s, it's probably worth 10 times the amount today. Timing, timing, timing matters. You're going to meet people that they're in a lease. They're going to meet people that want to buy now. There are people that have a 1031 exchange and they're uh, swapping properties. And so you should investigate their timing. And the third thing we want you to investigate is what they're interested in purchasing what they're interested in purchasing. And here's a great question or a great follow-up question. Maybe you start geographically and what region are you interested in? What neighborhood do you like? And do you have a model that you like? And 
And then you start going deeper and you say, why is that important to you? Why is that important to you? Why is that? And could you get these real nuggets out of the conversation that you're going to be able to use later on to say, hey, I found a real gem today and it's got that huge backyard and it's got that outdoor kitchen and it's got this or that that I think that you really, really wanted as you described when we met. And you're investigating and going deep to what their true needs and desires are. And this is the I part of the process. Lead in, L, then we have the I. You're getting to know them. You're investigating. Almost everything you say in this I process ends in a question mark not an exclamation mark. It's a bunch of questions. They're short, going deep, pulling key insights out that you can put in your back pocket and use later on to really help them as a consultative to help them find the right property. I'll add to that. I'll say too, you know, if, if, if we ask a few questions like through the buyer lead sheet or LP mama on the phone, we can prepare for this meeting and 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 we can actually like let's say it is before we go show them a home we can bring them a cma of the neighborhood of the home yep. that they're about to show right now and that's a way to add value we can set them on an email listing e-alert beforehand so yep. that they can, and we can tell them we're going to set you up on that so you can actually see what homes have sold for and what's pending in the neighborhood and at what prices so you're more educated and then when we're in person, those are two ways you can demonstrate value right away. Like that's something you couldn't have done on your own that we can now show you and we can demonstrate value all before we've shown the house, right? Yep. And then when we're sitting down, we can say, hey, you know, as, as we're asking these other questions about what you're looking for in a home, we can then tweak the listing e-alert settings so that you continue to get updates of other homes that fit your criteria. Again, yep. showing them value it's much more likely they're just going to feel comfortable. Like, man, I wish I've had all this for the last three months when I've been looking for homes on Zillow. This is easy. You're setting them up. You've actually demonstrated your professionalism that you have a process and that guess what? Here's my value. You didn't have this on your own because they just been looking at open houses or signs that pop up in the neighborhood. Now you're going to see you, all of them. Now you're, no you're, longer see a, you're no longer a tour guide. Yep. You're no longer just a door opener. You're their trusted advisor. This is what it feels like to be a client. Yeah. This is what it feels hey. like to be a client. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then, you know, Brian, at that point, you, you talked about items you can encourage, like, hey, I'll bring the CMA. I'll bring the path to buying your first home. I'll yeah, bring move you to the, the next properties. Step. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's helpful. I call those fair trade items. Like if I'm on the phone with a high C disc personality, they, they're like dotting the I's, crossing the T's. They love those pie charts. And you tell them you're going to bring them a CMA for the property, for the for the uh, homes and the community that they're interested. They eat that up. Oh, yeah. You tell them you're going to tell you're going to bring to them the stats of what the market's going to project over the next 12 months. They eat that stuff up. And so this is a good fair trade item to say, hey, why, when we meet, I'll have this ready for you. And sometimes it's that fair trade item, like something comes up, they're going to cancel the appointment. But, like, but I really want that item that that real estate agent pr uh, promised me. I, that's something important. I'm going to stay the course and show up to that appointment. We call it a fair trade. Give us 30 minutes of your time. We'll provide you some of those. Now, that fair trade item, you can't just use a boilerplate. You almost have to pick out what matters to them most. First time buyer might be the path to buying their first home. An investor, you know, what, what the best deals are, are on the market or the foreclosures or distressed properties or whatever, but you're gonna have to find what matters to them and that becomes the fair trade item. So lead in, you got to know them. I, you've investigated, that's where everything's ending in a question mark. Now we're on to this process, we call it the S. If you're, if you're taking notes, it's L-I-S now and we are at show and uh, show and share and here's the idea this is where you show and share your value this is where you show and share your value as a real estate professional this is where you can uh, provide an element of hey let me tell you how i can best help you accomplish your purpose your goals and what you're looking to accomplish notice that we didn't say tell and sell this is not the time you just brag about yourself and how great you are and and you're selling them on you and you're using every every sales script out there to get them to sign. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about you showing them how you can provide value in a course of the real estate transaction. And then you're sharing with them how they can how that can benefit them. It's kind of that feature function and benefit conversation. 
And this is our show and share part of this uh, process that we go through. And if you don't know how to do this, there's two really good documents that are out there. And uh, I'll try to drop them in the chat box before we leave. But if I can't, uh, we'll make sure that they're available for you when I send out this recording. The two documents that can really help you do this, you've already seen one of them. It's the, two, it's the National Association of Realtors Survey of Home Buyers and Sellers. They ask them what's most important to you in their real estate agent. And then it's the 179 ways also provided by the National Association of Realtors of ways you and I earn every penny or provide value. Start match, mirroring and matching these things. This is what they want. This is the services I provide. So if you can't quite articulate why you as a buyer's agent should have a written agreement with them and it's a value to them, these two documents can help you do that really, really well. And notice as you moved from the investigate to show and share your value, yeah. there's a lot of overlap there. In fact, I probably moved into show and share a little early uh, talking about the CMA, talking about the listing e-alerts, and because what I'm doing there is just demonstrating it. Like here, I'm doing yep. it. Like a, you're, you're see what it feels like. You're actually doing the work ahead of time, so they almost get a test drive. And we do this all the time with listings, right? If a listing says, "Oh, I'm not ready to list yet. I'm not ready to sign yet." Well, we start doing things like, well, hey, let me get my contractor out there and start doing some work for you ahead of time. And and let yep. me get, you know, how about I get my uh, photographer out there and we get it, get, get the photo shot ahead of time. Or maybe I can get my my handyman out there and or, or, or my, my carpet cleaner out there. So you start showing all your connections and all your valuable ahead of all your value ahead of time so that it softens it up to makes it make it a little easier for them to list with you and, and much harder to list with someone else. Why? That's right. You've created social guilt, and that's what we're going to do here. We are just, you know, I, I don't mean to be manipulative about it, but it, you do feel guilty when someone is doing a lot of work for you. You want to, you want us to reciprocate. And if someone's actually doing more work with you than you anticipated, again, remember they just called you to open the door, and and now they're starting to help you, and and you feel like it is helping you. It makes it a much more natural transition from customer to client and have them sign the buyer agency agreement. So demonstrating your value is just that, demonstrating your value throughout this appointment. And yes, you know, that NAR document is is very crucial because it's stuff you it, we're not saying you have to do a lot of stuff you don't do. Most of it you're already doing, we just don't know how to articulate it. Yeah. We don't know how to explain it. 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 We don't know how to show yeah, you're, it. And you're you're not going to articulate all 179. You're going to circle yeah. two or three of them and say, hey, this is the problem that I think uh, buyers are facing today. And this is the solution I provide. It's it's sales 101. There's a problem. You and I offer a solution. Uh, by the way, the statistic is that the average buyer is buying once every 10 years. So the last time they did this, it was done like on a cocktail napkin. And now you're going to sit with you and you gave them a, an encyclopedia full of disclosures. Last time they did this, they bid on a property and paid thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars less. Today, they're often in multiple offer situations, so it's all that opportunity to show and share your value. It's also a great time. I call it timestamp. Like we have a conversation, Brian. I just want you to know we're in a multiple offer environment, especially in your price point. And when we get to the point of of writing a mult in a multiple offer situation, here's how we handle it. Here's how I approach it. Now I've got ahead of that. So when we do get into a multiple offer situation, I said, Brian, remember when we talked, when you met at our office and how we're gonna handle a multiple offer situation? We're in that now. I'm not making it up on the fly. I'm not making it up in the moment. I'm now able to articulate our process and then to engage in that process when we get to that point. And that's the show and share. And we could talk about a million different ways that you and I can offer value from arranging inspections to you know, uh, helping with pricing your, the offer and, you know, negotiating the terms. There's a million different ways and you should have designations on this. You should have like a negotiation designation to say, hey, I'm an, I'm a certified negotiator today. If you don't have that, you can get one at the CTS and you can get a ne certified negotiator so that you can provide that real value in the show and share. That's one of our ICC courses. So shameless plug, yeah, go to EisenhowerCoaching.com. <laughs> All right, we got to move on, Brian. On you bet. <laughs> um, so if you're if you're taking notes, you know I've given you lead in, I've given you investigate, I've given you show and share. That's L-I-S, next one's T. 
Okay. And what we're, obviously where I'm going with this is your list. You get, you're getting a list or your listing. Um, and you're now paralleling the entire process that you do with buyers as you have done for years with sellers. And so this is no different than you do with a seller. You're going to lead in, you're going to investigate, you're going to show share how you can offer value, get the highest price, the least amount of inconvenience and a reasonable amount of time. And you're going to tie down. And that's the T. You got to get a decision. And, and we're going to advocate that you get a yes. Of course, that's preferred. Uh, yes, I'd like to hire you. Uh, or you would get a no. And that would be okay too. I'm okay with a no, especially if I find out at that point, you know, Rick, I'm really planning to use my family member who's a realtor. Like I'm okay that it saves me weeks after weeks after weeks after weeks and evening after evening and weekend after weekend of showing property. And they're just going to go with somebody else that's somebody that's that they're planning or I'm not planning to buy or I'm just interested because I'm a neighbor or whatever. And we've got to get a yes or a no or a qualified maybe. And a qualified maybe is the, are those people who say, you know, let me think about it. Let me talk to my partner, my spouse, whatever. Let me get back to you. And at that point, you might want to follow up with something like, hey, that would be no problem. Can I follow up with you later on this evening or would tomorrow morning be better? Can I reach out to you at five or would seven be better? Like it's always a qualified maybe. It's never left as a maybe. And you might have some objection handling techniques, which is this, just them extending the conversation, wanting to keep it going. But if you're at a point where it's a maybe and you're concluding that, make sure you make it a qualified maybe. So are you ready for the script that you're going to use in T tie down? Are you ready for it? Because yes. it's got six words, that simple. And and I, I want you to just simply say, Rudy, would you like to hire me? Mike, would you like to hire me? Shauna, would you like to hire me? Brian, would you like to hire me? Neil, would you like to hire me? That's it. It's six words. It's very simple. And then what I want you to do, catch this, I want you to shut up. I want you to close your mouth. Do not talk yourself out of the sale. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in this conversation with a real estate agent and they'll say, would you like to hire me? I know you have other options. And then they start talking themselves out of, out of a sale. Or I know that you're not interested in buying today, or I know this, or I know that, or you haven't qualified. Just say, would you like to hire me? Would you like to hire me? We've been doing this for a very long time. I don't need any notes to tell you this process. And I will tell you, if you follow that lead and investigate, show, share, and tie down the list process, they will list with you as a buyer. They will sign the agreement if you've offered value because they want to buy a home and they need a real estate professional. Never forget that uh, last year, 90% of people used a real estate agent. This is in the day of iBuyers and this is in the day of working uh, of, you know, Zillow Instant Offers and Open Door and all these different companies. And still 90% of real of buyers used a real estate agent to represent them on a purchase. It's real. It's important that you give them an opportunity that you ask for the sale. And would you like to hire me does that? And that's the tie down in this process. Once they say yes to that. We have a commitment, a verbal commitment, and then we can actually move forward into signing the actual written agreement right then and there. Brian, um, hand them a pin. Yeah. Everybody's very different then. Every state's different with their different buyer agency yep. agreements. And as 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 things evolve with the different compensation structures and that, I think we we explained how to kind of script through those and and and, and provide different options on that. Um, I mean, you're seeing different you're even seeing if someone absolutely will not commit to you that you can get a single property agency agreement. So you're yep. you're provided a, you know, compensation. I think a lot, of, you know, just for showing one property. In addition, you're going to see, you know, a, a lot of compensation. A lot of it depends on whether compensation is being paid for for buyers agents by the seller side. That still will be the majority, the vast majority of the time. Compensation will be advertised and offered out there. However, if it's not, it's going to be nothing new there either. I mean, if any of you have ever worked with home builders, you know, you you hurry up and get them registered or you get a commission agreement out to that seller before you show the property ahead of time and you try very hard to get compensated by the seller that way. It's another fair trade. I've got a client. You want me to show it. I'm going to go ahead and um, get that, agree that compensation nailed down ahead of time. That's been being done in the commercial real estate industry for decades. So 
Very, very similar there as well, too. But for the vast majority of the time, sellers aren't dumb. They know that they they want the exposure's the name to the game, and listing agents aren't dumb either. They're going to be able to explain that exposure's the name of the game, and they may not be doing automatic offers of compensation in the multiple listing service, but they can certainly advertise compensation to some degree out there. So because of that, it really isn't going to be all that much difference if compensation's being offered. But we are Ryan, going to get a signed agreement. Go ahead, Rick. We, we got to get it specifically in your MLS and my MLS, the term, you know, commission to the buyer's agent, commission to selling office, whatever they describe it in your market, it's going to go away. So you're going to write an offer and you're going to include a commission agreement. You're going to write an offer and you're going to share with a, a listing agent and their commission, just like we do today. You're going to write an offer and escalate the price and take some of that uh, as commission, you're going to write an offer and there's going to be a seller concession and that's going to be providing. So there's lots of ways when your buy, when your buyer says, great, how do you get paid? Yeah, I want to hire you. How do I get paid? Well, I got five or six different ways that I can get paid. And the very last way that I'm going to get paid is that you buy or pay. That's like the last option I see that the actual buyer pays. And I think it is going to be very, very rare that the actual buyer writes a check to make this happen. You're going to be able to say things like, I've sold the last 50 homes and I haven't had a buyer pay once. You know what I'm saying? I think you can say for the last 30 years, sellers have provided right. compensation to a buyer's agent to bring them to their home. That's true. The MLS began in the 80s, people, uh, with the purpose of being able to articulate a cooperating compensation. So the only difference is that field does not is not going to exist in the MLS that sailing commit that that agent commission and you're going to have to get a written agreement and if you have this organized sales process that culminates in not you having a customer but a client and you have that written agreement you've had this conversation you're going to resolve both of them then yep. when you write the offer and you go to contract include your commission agreement and your state's going to give you some direction on how to do that. The form, I think, will have some clarity and some options on how to do that. Uh, but th those are going to be the changes. And we know that we got to move 65% of agents to work with clients rather than customers to not try to hit a home run, but to start focusing on being a base hitter. And that's going to be a huge challenge for our industry. And those that are on this call, you're way ahead of the game because at the time of this recording, that proposed settlement hasn't even been approved yet. Yep. And a couple of things, I'll give you a couple of objection handlers to that too. If, if, if for some reason, you know, you hear the knee jerk ones because of all the news out there in the media about commissions and they're uncertain, they'll say things, well, I'm not ready to sign anything right now and, and things like that. And what you want to do when that comes up is you want to isolate their objections. Okay. That's the first thing you want to do. Okay. So I'll say, okay, what, what in particular is concerning you right now? So I want to find, I want to get a reason why you're not signing this agreement. And I, and I might even say, as they're thinking about it, I might even say, cause I, I'm actually required to have you sign this to be able to represent you. And if you answered yes to, yes, I'll hire you about 30 seconds ago. And I'm required to have a written agreement with you. What is it that concerns you? You see what I'm saying? That's why it's important to start with, Will you? would you hire me? If you start with that, then you bring it out and, and they won't sign it for whatever reasons. They may have a genuine question and, and that's why we isolate it to answer that question. Like, how am I going to get paid? We go through all the different ways we're going to get paid. Maybe that's it. Who knows? Otherwise, it's you're hiring me. What is it that concerns you? If they say, we got to think about it, I'll say, okay, great. Maybe I can help with that. I have no problem with that. Take your time. But what in particular is bothering you? Because that will help me. Maybe I can clear it up. So you always want to try to isolate the objection there. Get them thinking. If there's two of them and they just need to talk, I'll say, what concerns you? And if they just kind of seem stumped, like I just am pushing too hard, I'll say, I tell you what, would it help if I just left the room and let you guys think about it for a bit? That's actually powerful because oftentimes they just want to talk and make sure they're both on the same page. So I'll say, let me just get, uh, before they even answer, I'll say, I'll tell you what, no, no, you guys just stay here. Talk it out, think about it and get out of the freaking room and move far away and let them talk it out. And then you come back and say, so how are we doing? And usually they're okay at that point. They just wanted to make sure they're both, someone didn't want to step out in front of the other one. Very common. Yep. 
Brian, in my experience, the reason it doesn't get signed is not because of the buyer, not because of the consumer. It's because of the agent. The agent doesn't know how to express their value. That's right. When an agent follows this step, they they have confidence. They should not role play with the customer. They should be role playing with other agents in their office or role playing with their real estate coach or yep. whatever. But don't role play with the consumer. But if you have confidence and you say, would you like to hire me? And you've done all the steps that we've provided. They will say, yes, you will have a client. Now your job is to get them into contract. That's a whole nother topic for a different discussion. Um, the, the process we gave you is LIST, that is list. Um, the, 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 this will be a recording. I'll send this out to those that are on there, uh, that are on this link. And so that you'll have this. Let me just make one additional comment before we land the plane. I'll get any final feedback from you, Brian, and then we'll wrap up. You might be wondering, why are we talking about this as an executive leadership mastermind? And I go back to our baseball metaphor, and that's that because you and I are often base coaches, aren't we? Like we're first to second base coaches. We're second to third base coach. We're home. We're on home plate or first base. And we have to coach our team members on how to get from home, from first to second and second to third and third to home plate. And you and I have to be better base coaches today to articulate a process that people can follow. So my hope is that this call gives you some tools and some resources. You always have the seller conversion course and the custom training suite. You always have the buyer conversion course. This video will be populated there for future reference. And those can help you with more scripts, more dialogues. I read through our script book, Brian, there's two of them. And they're like 70 pages each with all the different dialogues and scripts and what you say and what they say. This is the difference between a professional and an amateur. This is the difference between running around and running a business. This is the difference between having a sales job and having a process, which means you have a business. Brian, any final words before I wrap up? Yeah, I did drop that buyer lead sheet, uh, the buyer questionnaire oh, cool. into the chat room. It's a PDF. It's a fillable form. So if you just download it, click on it and download it and you can you can have it. You, you guys all have access to that as well. And the other thing to remember is, you know, you guys are all leaders of different brokerages and real estate teams. How you how you look at this change, hopefully it's not too big of a change, but this is a this change is an opportunity for leadership. As a base coach, we're generally trying to slow people down on the bases so they make sure we've got a customer, then make sure we've got a client, right? So this is an opportunity for us to get in front of our people and teach and train. This is an opportunity to add value to the agents that work with us. This is what they look to you for. Things have shifted. They look to you for guidance to calm them down so that they can have confidence. So please embrace it right now. I know Rick's thrown um, some of the, the, the documents he promised in, into the chat as well, too. Um, so you can start downloading those as well, too. So embrace it like this. This is your chance to shine right now. There's been a big shift. Who do they look to? Their team leaders and their brokers to guide them. So you've got a lot of content right now to be using in your sales meetings and your team meetings or, or running little sessions on this so that we're adding massive value so they can go right now. That we do not need to wait for July or anything else from the government to yep. start doing it the right way. It's the way we should have been doing it the whole time anyway. That's right. And so uh, next month on the Executive Leadership Mastermind, we're gonna get back to the regular scheduled programming. Yeah. Uh, remember when they used to say that? We kind of took, uh, we called an audible. We felt like our team leaders needed to hear about the NAR settlement, the response, and what you should be doing today. We're gonna get back the topic next month. I'm gonna be focused on how you as a leader are empowered, especially with the idea of recruiting with artificial intelligence. And how do we use AI to leverage your time? not to replace you or even replace your staff members, but to empower them to uh, produce a multiple on their return uh, for you and for your company. So look, thank you for being a part of this and we'll see you all next month on the Executive Leadership Mastermind. Take care, see everybody. You.